Give me that. We all know this famous quote by Patrick Henry, but how many of us would actually be willing to take him up on the offer? How many of us, if given the opportunity, would be willing to put our own bodies in front of a line of tanks in order to stop them from entering our city? As recorded in the book Massacre in Beijing in 1989, this is exactly what happened in the Tiananmen Square protest. This lone Beijing man stood in front of a line of four tanks in order to blockade them from entering the city. When they tried to go around him, he moved to blockade them yet again. It wasn't until they pulled their guns on him and uh, threatened to shoot him that his friends pulled him to safety and he allowed the tanks to pass. However, the picture was taken and the moment immortalized forever. In the book uh, No Capture Needed in 2007, the authors state, the man in the tank would live on beyond the few tense moments of the encounter and become a permanent and universal symbol of the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests. But you might ask, what exactly happened during the Tiananmen Square protests? For that, I turn to the historian Timothy Brooke and his coverage of the, uh, in Quelling the People, a meticulously detailed account of the uh, uh, protest published in 1998. Now, there are a few key details that you need to understand, a few key characters that you must know who play a role in the protest. First, we have Deng Xiaoping, who is the supreme leader of the Communist Party in China. Second, we have his two protégés, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang. And finally, we also have the student, student protesters, a group of students who came from universities around the Beijing area. Now, the protests all started um, with Hu Yaobang's death of a heart attack on April 15th. The students decided to use his funeral as an occasion to have anti-government protests because Hu Yaobang uh, had supported the intellectuals and supported dissent as an essential part of um, the government system, gaining much anger from the party, but much love from the people and the students according to Beyond Tiananmen in uh, 2003. Now, the students, over 100,000 students from the uh, surrounding area turned out for protests on April 26th and May 3rd. Um, and because of all of the turnout that came, it arose the attention of Deng Xiaoping, who decided that he had to do something about it. Deng Xiaoping wanted to use force to nip the protests in the bud, so to speak. But Zhao Ziyang wanted to find a more peaceful solution instead according to the Tiananmen Papers in, published in 2001. Zhao Ziyang gave speeches on May 3rd and 4th, advising the students to seek a more peaceful solution of negotiation with the government, but the students didn't listen. Instead, they chose to go on a hunger strike to further reinforce their point. Hundreds collapsed daily over the lack of food and water, and by the end of the week, over 9,000 students had been hospitalized due to malnutrition. Now, um, Zhao Ziyang showed up in person uh, on May 19th to beg the students uh, not to stop taking such drastic measures to enter into negotiations with the government instead. The students finally agreed, but negotiations quickly, quickly broke down when they realized that Zhao Jiang could not grant their first demand, which was the complete rescission of all government published material that spoke against dissension. Now that peaceful negotiations had broke down, Deng Xiaoping decided that it was time to do things his way, by force. Deng Xiaoping declared martial law over the city of Beijing on uh, May 20th, but he had actually ordered the People's Liberation Army to take Tiananmen Square the night before, on May 19th. The army moved in under the cover of darkness, but their movements were quickly detected by the people who showed up in masses and crowds to block their way with their own bodies. They clogged the streets and stopped the military dead in their tracks because they could not, were not authorized to use force to get back past. Deng Xiaoping, furious at the defeat, ordered a full retreat of the army, who took up a perimeter on the city. Now, during this quiet time of peace after the first uh, attack, the, the students' protesters decided to end the protest once and for all on May 30th. They decided to make a final statement and erected this statue, the Goddess of Democracy, in Tiananmen Square. Over a million people turned out for that final protest, as you can see here, where they raised the statue of the Goddess of Democracy. However, instead of finally ending the conflict once and for all, the students instead exacerbated the problem. The Gaza Democracy statue was so foreign in America, a direct reference to America's own Statue of Liberty, that it alienated many of their local supporters for being such a foreign and American idea, and it enraged Deng Xiaoping to the point that he vowed to make a second attack and destroy the abomination once and for all. And that's exactly what Deng Xiaoping did. He mobilized the army once more, and, and sent them into the city. However, this time, they were authorized to use any force necessary to take the square. When people blockaded them, they first fired warning shots into the air um, to warn the people, but the people responded by throwing bricks and stones at them. They then started to fire into the crowds and bodies began to fall. The people, enraged that the government would turn its military on its people, 
decided to fight back in any way they could, throwing Molotov cocktails, bricks, and stones, and beating any soldiers they, they could get their hands on to the death. It was all out chaos. The soldiers returned fire, and the casualty count continued to rise. By the time the sun rose on the morning of June 4th, um, the, the military had succeeded in taking Tiananmen Square back from the students, firing into the students who refused to leave, um, but rather sacrificed their own lives. Now, now that the casualty count had risen, the uh, Chinese Red Cross reported in 1989 that 2,600 were dead and another 7,000 were wounded. Now that we have this mountain of bodies, we must ask, who's to blame for it? Can we really blame the government, who saw themselves in the role of a disciplining par parent, who saw the student protest as a counter-revolutionary riot and the suppression the only way of restoring order, according to a CQ researcher article in 2008? But can we really side on the side of the students as well? Because it's come to light that even though most of the students thought that their protests were nonviolent and the government should never have turned violence on them, um, it's been come to light that student leaders not only knew but expected um, and wanted the killings to happen. For instance, student leader Chai Ling said in 2001, I felt so sad because how can I tell them that what we are actually hoping for is bloodshed, the moment when the government is ready to butcher the people brazenly. <coughs> She wanted this so that only with death would um, the protest leave a mark on permanent history. But the um, killings did happen, and now we are left in his wake deciding what we can learn from the situation. I hope that you have all come to a better understanding of what happened in the 1989 Tiananmen Square protest. Not only what happened, but also that the issue is too complex to place blame on one party or the other. I also hope that we never forget the sacrifices that our founding fathers made to give us the liberties we enjoy today. Because at the end of the day, which of us is willing to stand in front of a line of tanks in order to stop them from entering our city for our liberties? Thank you.